Welcome to From Amiens to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director for the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, we are at the Newfoundland Memorial Park at Beaumont Hamel, where the students explore the preserved battlefield and trenches, following in the footsteps of the Newfoundland Regiment on the morning of the 1st July 1916. Hello everyone, my name is Jenna. I'm one of the guides that works here at Beaumont Hamel. I'm one of 17 Canadian students working over in France for four months. The site focuses specifically on the Newfoundland Regiment throughout the First World War. You'll be seeing the preserved battlefield and learn a bit of the history. There are roughly two to 300 men that were left out on no man's land that still lay there resting today. 70 to 80 of those men are Newfoundlanders, so it's very important to be respectful. If you do have any questions at any time, please don't hesitate to ask. We're all around the site in our lovely Canadian uniforms. We're going to follow in the footsteps, quite literally, of the Newfoundland Regiment and their attack on the 1st July. Now, they came up through that communication trench, Uxbridge Road, overnight on the lead-up to the 1st July. They'd been in and around this trench system for several weeks. They knew the trenches. What they didn't really know much about was what was beyond. Apart from using aerial photos, using the trench maps they created to try and work out what was beyond. The days before the attack had been fairly wet. Trenches were muddy. Thousands of men were moving into positions ready to start their attack. The Newfoundland regiments were to be in the second wave. They were timed to follow up after the initial attack had been made. So they've been brought forward into these support trenches along St John's Road and will then make their attack in the direction of the German positions over there. What we're going to try and do is use the map, but also the diary of the unit to make sense of what was happening here. Listening in. 7.30 hours, 88th Brigade under prearranged orders were to move forward at 8.40 to attack third line system of trenches. About 8.20 received orders not to move until further orders, presumably the first attack not having been successful. 845 hours received orders on the telephone to move forward in conjunction with the 1st Essex Regiment and occupy the enemy's first trench. Our objective being point 89, to just north of point 60 and work forward to Station Road, clearing the enemy trenches. Move as soon as possible. Ask Brigade if the enemy's first trench had been taken and received reply to the effect that the situation was not cleared up. Ask Brigade if we were to move to the attack independently of the Essex Regiment received reply in the affirmative. 0915 hours reported to Bridge Aid that Newfoundland Regiment was moving off. The advance was made direct over the open from the rear trenches known as St. John's Road and Clonmel Avenue. As soon as the signal for advance was given, the regiment left the trenches and moved steadily forward. Machine gun fire from our right front was at once opened on us, and then artillery fire also. The distance from our objective varied from 650 to 900 yards. The enemy's fire was effective from the outset, but the heaviest casualties occurred on passing through the gaps in our front wire, where the men were mown down in heaps. 0945 hours. The CO reported personally at Brigade Battle HQ 100 yards behind our firing line that the attack had failed. Shortly afterwards, the enemy opened an intense bombardment of our trenches with heavy artillery which was kept up for some time. During the night and evening, unwounded soldiers managed to crawl back to our own lines and by the next morning, some 68 had answered their names. 801 attacked at 9 o'clock on the morning of the 1st July. 68 out of 801 answered the roll call the following morning. This is what General Delisle the divisional commanding officer wrote, it was a magnificent display of trained and disciplined valor and its assault only failed of success because dead men cannot advance anymore. This petrified preserved tree here is called the danger tree. It was a feature of the battlefield in no man's land in 1916. 
It was a ranging point for the German machine guns. And the records suggest that not a single member of the Newfoundland Regiment moved beyond that point on the morning of the 1st July. My name's Hugh Strawn. I'm Professor of International Relations at St Andrews University. It's about 10.15 on the morning of the 7th of August 2018. It's a beautiful day, much as it was on the 1st of July 1916. I'm standing at the bottom of what is now defined as Newfoundland Park, of the area at Beaumont Hamel over which the Newfoundland Regiment launched what was the second attack of that morning, the first attack having failed. And just behind me, I'm looking up towards the Caribou Memorial, behind me are the German lines as they were in July 1916, with Y Ravine, as it was called, uh, the furthest point of the advance in the five months of fighting in 1916. It's a deep ravine, not visible even from here, and certainly not visible from the ground as you were attacking on the 1st of July 1916, but providing protection, of course, for the German soldiers that occupied it, both from observation and very often from artillery fire. Landscape on the Somme is a series of rolling hills with much ground hidden from immediate observation but at the same time with no really dominant positions. It had been held by the Germans since 1914, well fortified since 1914. As you approach this particular sector, much of what you're going to confront is hidden in immediate terms because of that rolling landscape but then suddenly becomes evident and exposed when you breast a ridge. So as you come on to the Beaumont Hamel sector, which is where we are, you see very little to begin with, and then suddenly it's wide open. And of course it was wide open to German defensive fire, to those machine guns that had been positioned for some time, and even more importantly, to the artillery behind them, both of which had had time to prepare their lines and fields of fire. The Newfoundland Regiment began its advance from behind the British front line and they had to do that because the communication trenches were clogged with returning wounded and therefore in order for them to come forward they had to get out of the communication trench and come over the top of the ridge seeing nothing of the enemy positions before they did so. As they came over that ridge, they come into an open space known to the Germans, prepared defensively by the Germans for the previous 18 months, and they have probably three or four hundred yards of no man's land to cover. On a beautiful summer's morning, the sun by then had been up for several hours, but of course is behind the Germans still, because they're to the east, and full in the face of the Newfoundlanders as they come down, because it is down at that point from the crest, towards the German positions. And the losses suffered by the Newfoundland Regiment were crippling. Essentially, the entire battalion wiped out as an effective unit. And that battalion is the Newfoundland contribution to the war. They'd fought at Gallipoli, but at the very late stages of the campaign, suffering comparatively low loss of life. Here, in a matter of minutes, they are obliterated. This position will not actually be taken until the very end of the Somme battles in November 1916 when the 51st Highland Division take this ground. So this is a cemetery occupied very largely by the dead from Newfoundland and the dead of the 51st Highland Division. You have been listening to From Amiens to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, we visit Sunken Lane and Hawthorne Crater near Beaumont-Hamel.